Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Woohoo! It is so good to see your faces. Why don't you stand with us? Let's worship together.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love.
God, we come to you this morning, just like we're singing those words, there is so much power in the name of Jesus. And that's the name that we want to stand on this morning. Just like these songs are singing, God, you are our hope and our mercy. But God, the stone that the builders rejected, Jesus is the cornerstone. And that's what we want to build on today. And God, we are trusting in you. God, fill this place as we know that you are already here. But God, let us grow with you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. Actually, to be able to see your teeth this morning. No, or just seeing your face, the good smiles. It's great to be together. We're just a blessing to uh, see so many people here today. And if you're streaming online still, we're just so thankful that you've tuned in. What, what a good thing just to be together in the name of the Lord in that powerful and a wonderful and amazing name. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, has anybody been avoiding going outside this week? Between the noise and the smell and just the dive bombs everywhere, mowed the yard yesterday, and it's like they're coming from all over. But I just got, I got news for you. They said this week it's going to get worse. <laughs> so just so you know that, and uh, just be prepared for that. But you know what? I think you're going to be really glad that you're in here. I think we're a Zakata-free zone. I heard somebody brought one in with them, but I think we're taking care of that one. So, but we're just thankful that you're here and made this a part of your day and a part of your experience. A um, couple of things I want to let you know that's coming up. And next Sunday, we really want to encourage you to be here. And uh, we got uh, a special time of, of, that we do once a year where we just kind of bring you up to speed on what's going on around here. We, we uh, let you affirm the new leaders that have been selected, new elders, and then also look at the budget. And, and we are going to roll out a challenge next week that we think is just going to be really special. And we want you to be here. Next week, there will be children ministry classes at both hours, just for next week, because we're still working on getting the volunteer base up. But for next Sunday, we're going to have uh, opportunities for your children in both services. And so you want we want everybody to be here to be a part of that. So thank you for that. Um, and then after church next Sunday, at, in the Heritage Room, which is right over here, uh, after the second service, there'll be a meeting for anyone interested in going and helping with the Kentucky Relief uh, trip in July. So that's coming up. Randy Adams is the contact person for that. If you have any interest in that, let him know or just come next Sunday. Stay around after the second service and come to that meeting. That's going to come up and be here fast. But you guys have been wonderful in responding to that. A couple other things real quick since you maybe this is your first time back in a while or maybe you're new with us today. Uh, we do have a time of communion later on, a quiet, reflective time. And the elements for communion are on the tables in the back and over here at the side. If you want to be a part of that, then we ask you to pick those up. And it's okay to go anytime and get that, and we'll be okay with that. And then uh, an offering. Offering, we just we don't pass the plates anymore. We just have the boxes on the wall. So if you have an offering to give to the Lord, just say a prayer and drop it in the box. And thank you very much. Um, and Matt Robinson is going to come up right now, and he's going to introduce our speaker. You're in for a special treat. We're so thankful to have Matt Howe with us from Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Here you go, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, it is great having you here today. You all are in for a special treat. Normally, you've got to listen to, to me, but today you get to listen to a different Matt, a better Matt, a, a more improved Matt. Um, all right, just pray. Yeah, just, just pray and get it over with, right? Um, no, we have the, the privilege today of having Matt Howe from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He's the Cincinnati City Director and he is just doing uh, really powerful things in the community. Uh, he's got a table set up in the lobby, and there actually will be, we'll be collecting uh, lightly used, uh, gently used sports equipment that they're going to be taking to, to kids that don't have the sporting equipment. That's going to be a great opportunity to serve in that regard. But before, before I pray for you, Matt, uh, I have to tell you all how I met Matt for the first time. So Matt, before he was the FCA director in Cincinnati, uh, was a youth pastor. And so I met him at Nagel Middle School. And it was an awesome friendship right from the beginning because most of the time when you're a student pastor and you ask somebody else to help out, they say no. They go, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm busy. Or they just, they're honest with you and they say, I don't want to. But every time I said, hey, I've got this idea, Matt, would you be interested 
Matt was like, yeah, I'm there. Let's go. And every time I was at Nagel, you were already there to the point where I wondered if, like, you lived at Nagel. And that was just really incredible. And so in so many ways, you have blessed this church, these people. Matt actually uh, led a staff and elder retreat back in January. Uh, we have been so blessed since earlier in the year when they made their offices in our building, when FCA pulled their offices uh, for Cincinnati into Parkside. You guys are, are going to have a great time. I am going to stop talking now and pray for you. I'm so excited to have you here today, though. Let me pray. God, I just pray for everyone that is going to be listening, uh, whether they're here in person or they're, they're streaming online, Lord. Give us ears that hear and a heart that is willing to change. Lord, I know uh, that, that Matt is bringing truth from your word and that the Holy Spirit has empowered those words but it still comes down to our willingness to change. So Lord, uh, bless Matt. Give him the guidance, the words to say how to say it. But, but Lord, help us to have ears that hear and a heart that is willing to change. Bless this time this morning. And thank you so much for what Matt does. Thank you for uh, the ways that he impacts the lives of coaches and athletes and families in this community. I pray that you would bless him and his team in all they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Morning, church. So I definitely got uh, my $20 worth. I, I slipped him a 20 before the service to say all those nice things. And the good news is he slipped me a 50. So uh, let me just share with you my feelings on your pastor. Um, just a fantastic guy. Uh, I shared this with your leadership back earlier in the year. But when I arrived into town back in 2012, uh, I had a card on my desk with my name on it. And uh, it was from uh, your now pastor, then student pastor, Matt Robinson just welcoming me to town with a Grader's gift card, right? So it doesn't get any better than that, a little bit of ice cream uh, right, off the, uh, right off the get-go. But um, networked a lot together over the years and kind of had a feeling that someday he would be the pastor of this church. And so just so thrilled uh, to see that that is where he has led the congregation collectively and now to see him take over the reins I think is fantastic. Have no doubt that you all, yes, yes, absolutely. Have no doubt that you will be a very missional church, a very mission-minded church, community-minded and that's really what it's all about, you know, and that's really what FCA is about. Uh, FCA is an organization that was founded back in 1954 uh, by a college basketball coach named Don McClannan, and Don's vision was very simple. It was to see the platform of sports used to share the gospel. Uh, he saw where coaches and athletes were using their platform to share about just about everything else in the market, just about everything else in the world, and he said, why not, why not the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so that's where it started. And now 66 years, years later, here we are. We have uh, literally thousands of staff all across the world. We're in over 90 countries, uh, and we're here in Cincinnati. Been in Cincinnati since 1979 when a huddle started at Deer Park High School. And so uh, God is continuing to move through this ministry. Would love to tell you more about it. I'm not going to take my sermon time to do it because some of you probably are like, like my oldest daughter, you think that when a person scores a goal in basketball, it's called a touchdown, right? You don't care about sports, okay? So I'm not going to bore you with it, but there is a table out back. We do have some literature, and if you want to come talk to me afterwards, I'd love to talk to you. I do want to give a little special shout out to uh, Mr. David Lunn over here, who has uh, been working with our, yeah, with our FCA huddle at Anderson High School for, uh, I don't know, Dave, how many years? 14 years, right? So he was FCA long before I was FCA, right? So maybe he should be standing on stage right now, okay? But very thankful for guys like him, coaches like him, uh, all over the city who are doing similar things in their schools. So just very excited about that. So this morning we are going to preach a sermon, all right? And it is falling in line with your kingdom series that you've been working through. Uh, and so if you have a Bible with you this morning, you can go ahead and open it to the book of 1 Kings. Uh, eventually we're going to make our way to chapter 9. But before we get there, we're actually going to do a little foreshadowing and we're going to start in chapter 3. Because chapter 3 of 1 Kings is where we read that God visited Solomon. How many of you have heard of Solomon? Yeah, what was Solomon known for? Both, right? Building the temple and being wise, right? Um, kind of what Matt Robinson and I often are known for, our wisdom, right? Right. Uh, known for his wisdom, right? But we see where God visited Solomon in a dream, and that is in that dream where Solomon asked God for wisdom. 
And the Bible tells us that the Lord was so pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom that he blessed him with said wisdom. And the rest, as they say, is history, right? In the chapters that follow, we see this man, this mighty king, Solomon, and all of his wisdom building the temple, building this nation of Israel, right? And it would seem that things were going really smoothly. Things were going really well for Solomon. Upon the temple's completion, the Lord visits Solomon a second time. And that's where we pick up in 1 Kings chapter 9, the first nine verses. I'm going to read this. Uh, I believe it'll be on the screen behind me. Just, just bear with me and follow along. It says, When Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had achieved all that he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe uh, my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their ancestors out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. Okay, let us pray. Father God, we are thankful for your word. You are good. Your word is good. And so today, may it reign supreme in our hearts, Father. May you teach us something. May we leave this building changed by you and your word. Uh, Father, thank you uh, God, just for the opportunity to stand on this stage and to share the message that you've laid on my heart. Bless us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So, after Solomon had finished building the temple, God appeared to him a second time. Just as he had appeared to him in Gibeon when Solomon asked for wisdom. God assured Solomon that he had heard his prayer at the temple dedication. God said, I have consecrated this temple, which you have built, by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will also be there. That word name represents an extension of self. God is literally saying to Solomon, myself, I will be there. My whole self is there. That word eyes was understood as representing the gathering of information and therefore a, a knowing, a sense of knowledge, a sense of wisdom. God's knowledge, God's wisdom was there in the temple. And while in English that word heart is used metaphorically for the seat of emotions in contrast to logic and reason, Hebrew actually uses that word as the center of both emotions and reason and intellect. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that the whole self of God was to be present in the temple. God would show his covenant love to his people by residing in that temple in a very unique way, a big way. God makes this promise to Solomon. However, he tempers this promise a little with some conditional warnings, and that's kind of what we're going to dig into a little bit this morning. Now, I'd like to refer to these warnings as an eye test. How many of you have ever heard the words eye test in relationship to sports specific? Anybody ever heard that concept, the eye test? All right, so let me explain what that is, okay? In sports, the eye test, E-Y-E, -E, is a way to judge an athlete as they compete within their sport based on one's own observations. We live in a world where the information available to us is just, is, it's just incredible, right? And so you can imagine if you're a scout that there's just information flying to you all the time about these different athletes. Whether you're scouting at a collegiate level, whether you're scouting at a professional level, it doesn't matter. But, but the eye test would say, hey, it's not by statistics, it's not by information, it's not by the media's report, or by any other means, but rather by a person's own two eyes that were able to judge the authenticity, the ability of a particular athlete. 
Proponents of the eye test would say that you should never assume that something you hear about a particular athlete is true. Instead, they would say that you must see them for yourself. Proponents of the eye test would be hesitant to listen too closely to anything regarding high school athletes entering college or the professional ranks. Just because someone is dubbed as a superstar doesn't necessarily mean they are, right? We, we see that in sports. We see it a lot in Cincinnati, right? <laughs> we get a player, we think they're going to be a superstar, and they turn out to be kind of a dud, right? Hey, let me just tell you something, though. I was talking to someone in the back table, and they were asking, they said, what about our athletes here in the city? Do we have faithful Christian uh, male and female athletes in the city? And I said, absolutely resounding yes. Um, I've had the opportunity to be on some of our college campuses. I've had the opportunity to be down to practices for our football programs, our basketball programs. Uh, I've worked with the Reds. I've worked with the Bengals. Uh, let me just say that all of those organizations have um, godly men and women working in and around them. And so that's a blessing, you know? And, and honestly, it helps me to root for them even that much more to succeed, right? Hey, we're on a, like a three-win win streak with the Reds, right? So we're doing good. We're doing good, all right? So that's the eye test, right? But what I want to talk about is a different kind of eye test this morning. And this eye test can also prove the authenticity and ability of things, but it's a little bit different. We're calling this one the eye test because every word of this test starts with the letter I, okay? So this eye test that we see in chapter 9 of 1 Kings, it's a different kind of eye test. In this test, we use three words that literally all begin with the letter I. I grew up in a Baptist tradition where the minister always had to have three or four points, and each one always had to start with the same letter. So that's what I'm doing for you today, okay? I'm giving you words that all start with the letter I. That's easy. If you take notes, you can write them down. If you don't, you can forget them. It doesn't matter, all right? So here they are. I, I like to use sarcasm and humor, so you feel free to not think that I'm, like, losing it up here, okay? It's I, just me being goofy, all right? So here they are, the three words, integrity, idolatry, identity, Okay, I think we can pull all three of these words from this passage in 1 Kings chapter 9, and we're going to, okay? So integrity, we're going to start there. The first I of the eye test is this word integrity. If you and I were going to score ourselves this morning using this test, we would ask this simple question. Am I a person of integrity? So maybe just under your breath this morning, go ahead and ask, your that, ask yourself that question. Am I a person of integrity? You see, this first warning that God gave to Solomon, although stated positively, was still a, a warning, right? God promised Solomon, he said, if you will walk faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, then I will establish my throne over Israel forever. Seems pretty simple. Do what is right in the sight of the Lord and remain faithful to him and what? He will bless you. I would say the same promise is there for us to claim today. Do what is right in the sight of the Lord, remain faithful to him, and he will bless you. Sounds simple. But here's the thing. Being a person of integrity is not always so simple, is it? I mean, how many times a week, how many times a day, how many times an hour when you're with your kids is your integrity tested? A lot. FCA has four core values. Excellence, service, teamwork, and you guessed it, integrity. We want all of our staff who wear our emblem on their sleeve, right, or on their shirt. We want all of our volunteers, like a David Lund, right? We want all of our coaches and athletes that we're working with to be people of integrity. What does that mean? A person of integrity is one who demonstrates Christ-like wholeness both privately and publicly. It means what? That you're the same person when no one else is looking that you are when everyone else is looking. That you're the same person when everyone else is looking as you are that when no one is looking. That's a person of integrity. We've got to be that person. Hall of Fame football coach Tony Dungy. Anybody ever heard that name, Tony Dungy, before? He's with the Colts for a while, with the Bucks for a while, right? He's been around. He's now an analyst uh, on television. You see a lot of him. Got a bald head like mine, right? Fantastic guy, right? Written a lot of really great books, done a lot of really great things for FCA ministries, spoken at a lot of our events, marriage retreats, all these different things. Tony puts it this way. He says, having integrity is not a sometimes thing. 
You either have it or you don't. He tells a story about when he was early on in his coaching career. He was actually an assistant for the um, <clears throat> Pittsburgh Steelers. Sorry, I have to kind of say that under my breath. I, if I say it too loud, the Lord might, you know. Uh, he was an assistant for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they were going to be playing a game against the Denver Broncos, okay? Tony gets word through a member of the media who had been out watching the Denver Broncos in a practice that the Denver Broncos have been working on this sort of trick play that they are going to run against the Steelers on Sunday. And so Tony immediately, early on in his career as a young assistant, is faced with this challenge, this challenge to his integrity. Do I take this insider information that I'm really not supposed to know about and use it as a way of giving my team a one-up on this possible trick play, or do I kind of just keep that one in my pocket, not address it, and let whatever happens, happens, right? And you can imagine at a coach at that high level trying to work your way up, the temptation had to be incredible. But Tony chose to be a person of integrity. He chose not to let his team know what was going to happen. Well, you can imagine, Sunday came around, game came around, what did Denver do? They ran the trick play. What happened? They scored a touchdown. Now, the positive side of that story is the Pittsburgh Steelers actually came back to win, like they often do, <laughs> right? We know about that in Cincinnati. But... The bottom line is, Tony chose to be a coach, a man of integrity, right? And that really set the, set the course for the remainder of his coaching career. Several months ago, my integrity was tested. Some of you can probably relate to this story. I was at Target. Anybody ever been to Target? <laughs> Anybody go to Target daily, right? Uh, I mean, there's lots of cool things there, right? I mean, where else can you buy, like, cool boxer shorts and bread? I mean, you know? So, went to Target, and I'm at Target, and I see this thing that I've been wanting for a while. It's a pair of boxing gloves. All right, my son had some, and we've got a sparring, we've got a heavy bag in the basement, and we've been doing some stuff. So I, I grab these boxing gloves, they're at a pretty good price, more reasonable than Dick's Sporting Goods, sorry Dick's Sporting Goods, but I stick them under my arm, and as I'm walking out of the store, I grab a couple other things, and as I'm walking out of the store, I run into somebody I know, which often happens in Target or Kroger or anywhere else around here, right? And so we strike up a conversation, friendly conversation, lasts a couple of minutes, bye, good to see you, yeah, you too, head out the door, go up, go up to the front to pay, put my items down on the you know, conveyor belt or whatever. This young man checks me out. Uh, I get out the door, you know, bye, good to see you, thank you. Walk on out, go to the car, open up the car, put my bags in, and as I go to raise my arm, I realize the boxing gloves are still stuck under my arm. Anybody ever had that happen? Anybody ever accidentally shoplifted? Anybody ever shoplifted on purpose? Okay, all right, we're not gonna go there, all right? So I, you know, I did what any good, strong man of Christian faith would do. I got in my car, sped home, and singed, sung the song, Hallelujah, I saved 35 bucks. No, I, uh, I chose to go back in the store and pay for the boxing gloves, okay? But listen, how easy would it have been for me to just say, oh, well, their mistake, not mine. I mean, if they had wanted to stop me, they could have stopped me. Somebody could have said something. Maybe they, don't know, maybe they didn't notice. Maybe they noticed and they just don't care that much. It's only 35 bucks, right? You shop there all the time. How much money do you spend at Target in a week? You got four kids. You got to feed a 14-year-old boy. Come on, you're spending a fortune, right? It's okay. Just keep the boxing gloves. That's what the world screams at us, lies all the time, challenging and testing our integrity. Are you going to do the right thing, even when no one else except the $3,000 surveillance camera at Target is watching, right? What are you going to do? Solomon, in all his wisdom, said this in Proverbs 10, verse 9. He said, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Sounds like a warning your grandmother would give you, right? Right? My grandmother passed away uh, this past January, um, and she was that woman in my life. She had grown up Catholic, uh, had grown up under the nuns, you know, and all their, all their leadership, and uh, she was just kind of a, you know, got to do, right, do things the right way kind of way, but she would call me out on stuff, you know, and that's kind of what this sounds like. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. I can hear her saying it to me. She called me Maddie. I don't know why. My name's Matt. Actually, her name's Matthew. She called me Maddie. Anyway, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. But whoever takes crooked paths, Maddie, right, will be found out. And isn't that true? Isn't it true? Doesn't it always come back to bite us when we compromise, when we, when we allow our integrity to be compromised? I think it does. That's the first eye of the eye test. Second eye is idolatry. Everybody say idolatry. idolatry. 
All right, just wanted to make sure you're still awake, that you have a pulse. We're good. If you and I were scoring ourselves using this eye test this morning, and we came to this word idolatry, the question we would want to ask is, is there idolatry in my heart? Is there idolatry in my heart? And, and you know, the, probably right off the bat, most of us would say, oh, no, 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 no. But then we start getting into it, and it looks a little bit, so I'm going to get into it a little bit, okay? So Solomon has this warning given to him in verses 6 through 9. God let Solomon know that if Solomon or his sons, all right, so it's like, man, it's not just you, it's your offspring. If you or your sons turn away from following me, then they will be, you will be cut off from the land and the temple. It's not going to be good. That's what he's telling him. It's not going to be good for you. All would be lost if idolatry replaced the worship of God in the temple. Now, Solomon was wise, and we know that wisdom is worth way more than riches, and that our children's greatest inheritance from us should be the wisdom that we've learned from God. But unfortunately, the wisdom that Solomon had received from God didn't necessarily translate into every area of Solomon's life, and it certainly didn't translate to his son and heir, Rehoboam. Solomon's failure to apply God's wisdom in his leadership led to his son taking over the throne with a wisdom deficit. The great growth and advances that the kingdom of Israel had made during Solomon's reign, they didn't last long after his rule. Under his son's leadership, the kingdom split into two. Rehoboam failed to listen to the appropriate set of advisors. There was a revolt. Ten tribes formed what was called the northern kingdom, now known as Israel, and the southern kingdom where Rehoboam ruled was known as Judah. And that was the kingdom where he reigned for 17 years. And during those 17 years, there were constant battles back and forth and back and forth between the northern and the southern kingdom. And man, that southern kingdom of Judah, it was like a Sodom and Gomorrah. Sin was running rampant all over the place. And idolatry was just one of the many sinful failures of that kingdom. In FCA, we have a saying we use an invisible, false god, little g, known as sports, right? Because let's face it, sports has become a god in a lot of people's lives. We use that to introduce coaches and athletes to a visible, living, and true god. Sports is certainly one of the many things that we have made an idol. We idolize teams. We idolize players. We idolize the athletic body, our bodies, the bodies of others. We idolize trophies, medals, rings, scholarships, championships. I mean, how much of sports do we make an idol? But sports are not all that we idolize. There are other things as well. Work can become an idol for us. Education can become an idol for us. Money, possessions, maybe the arts, fame, popularity, even relationships with family and friends can become idols in our lives if we're not careful. Is there idolatry in my heart? Jesus says it this way, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? That's what he says. Those are his words. What does that mean? It means that that which we treasure also has our devotion. Where are you spending the bulk of your time? Where are you spending the bulk of your talent? Where are you spending the bulk of your treasure? Chances are, whatever or whomever you are spending it on also has your heart, also has your devotion, also has your worship. It's just true. And, and you know, when we think about that, passing this wisdom on to the next generation, we have to remember that our children, our grandchildren, if you don't have children and grandchildren, the children in your neighborhood, the children who pass you walking down the street, they hear everything. Everything. It's a sober reminder to me quite often that they hear me in everything that I'm saying. They know better than anyone whom and what you spend your time on. They know better than anyone whom or what you give your time to, whom or what you spend your treasure on, don't they? They see it. They hear it. They know it. Psalm 16, 4 says, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. And I would say you could just keep, keep going with that. Those who suffer after other gods will suffer more and more and more and more and more. 
we got to stop running after these idols. we got to stop putting everything else on our list ahead of him. We have to. The third I is identity. Identity. If you and I were scoring ourselves using the I test this morning, we would have to ask ourselves this question. Is my identity in Jesus Christ? Is my identity in the person Jesus Christ? Now, this word identity is not mentioned specifically in our passage this morning. But I do believe that if you, that if you look at what ultimately led to the demise of the kingdom, it was an identity crisis. It was an identity crisis, specifically within the leadership. If I were to pull out my identification card, every one of us has one, right? We have a driver's license or a passport or something, student ID, whatever, that has our identification on it, right? That we can show at different places to, to access different things or that allows us to legally do different things. And on that identification card, if I were to pull out, like, say, my driver's license, it would tell you that I am six foot tall, two inches, six, six, two and shrinking, right? I turned 40 last year. I think I'm starting to shrink a little bit. My son, who's 14, is now as tall or maybe even taller than me. It would tell you I'm 6'2". It would tell you that I have brown eyes. It would tell you that I have brown hair. Had brown hair. Funny, right? Our identity is what defines us. And guess what? Our identity is way more than brown hair, brown eyes, feet and inches. So the question is, what defines you, what describes you this morning? If you're a child of God this morning, that is what defines you. You should be pulling out your ID, and on that ID there should be three words, child of God. What does that mean? It means that you are created and loved by God for God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of of Almighty God, in His likeness. He knows you in a way that you don't even know yourself and that no one else knows you. He loves you in a way that you don't even love yourself and no one else loves you. That's who God is. Too often, people, including myself, base our identities on what we do, what we look like. Our titles that we wear, right? Chances are, if you meet someone for the first time, what's one of the first things you share? What you do. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a minister. That's probably the first three things people learn about me before they ever hear anything about I'm a child of God. What if we just started introducing ourselves that way? Hi, what's your name? Jim. What's your name? Oh, my name's Matt. What do you do, Matt? Well, first and foremost, I just want to tell you I'm a child of God. What? Right? What would that do? What would that immediately do for the conversation? What doors would that immediately open up? And you're like, no, that would slam doors shut. I'll bet you $10 it doesn't. And $10 is a lot to a father of four. You'd be surprised. But what would happen if we started introducing ourselves? I'm a child of God. First and foremost, that's the most important thing. Yes, I'm a husband. Yes, I'm a father. Yes, I'm a minister. And these are all titles that I wear with pride. But I am so much more than any one of those things. And when I allow myself to be defined solely by any of those titles, I significantly limit my life. The truth is that God intends for all people to find their identity in and through Jesus Christ. In and through Jesus Christ. And here's a few things that you might need to hear. I need to hear them from time to time, so I'm just going to guess that there's someone here that needs to hear them. So I'm going to share them with you this morning. Here are some things that are true from you, true for you, if your identity reads child of God this morning. You ready? Here they are. You are loved. You are blessed. You are appreciated. You are forgiven. You are reconciled. You are adopted. You are wanted. You are saved. You are new. You are heard, you are valuable, you are gifted, you are rewarded, you are victorious. That's who you are. You are a child of God. Yeah, absolutely. But listen, how often do we really live that out? How often do we live as one who is loved? who is blessed, who is appreciated, forgiven, reconciled, adopted, wanted, saved, new, heard, valuable, gifted, rewarded, and victorious. How often do we really live that way? 
Not often enough. Not often enough. I'll tell you one word that defines me a lot. Defeated. If I'm being honest, that's how I walk around a lot. I walk around defeated. We tell our athletes all the time, Coach Lund, don't we? Don't hang your head. Right? Live for the next play. Right? You're all right. Pick yourself up. Right? But how often do we walk around with our heads hung? How often in the last year and a half have we, as believers in Christ, walked around defeated? Man, if there was ever a time on planet Earth when we had the chance to share the testimony and the light and life of Jesus Christ, it was during COVID-19, and yet so many of us walked around what? Defeated. Defeated. Because we forget that on our ID card, first and foremost, are those three words. Child of God. Child of God. That's who you are this morning. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Proverbs 27, verses 23 through 24 says, Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. Man, what would it do, church, if we started paying a little more attention to our herds? What would it do if we really knew the condition of our flocks? And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the young people who are growing up in our homes. I'm talking about the grandbabies. I mean, grandparents, you know, you've never been more, I mean, let's just be honest, you've never been more excited than you were when you had your first grandbaby, okay? Your kids were okay, right? Your grandbabies are special, right? <laughs> but what would it do if we started really paying close attention to our herds, if we really knew the condition of our flocks? Are you building a kingdom? And we got a lot of them in Anderson Township. We got a lot of them around this community, right? We got a lot of kingdoms being built. Are you building the kingdom, as in the kingdom of God? What are you building up? What are you passing on? Look, if I look at my childhood growing up, these are the two things that I learned more than anything above all else from my, fam from my parents. How to always be right and always be good. How to always be right and always be good. Jesus was left completely out of the equation. Church-going family my entire life as a young child. Church-going family. Went to church every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. Church, 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 church. Always be right, always be good. That's the message of American Christianity. Man, we got to get Jesus back in the equation. We got to remember that it starts, ends, finishes, begins, everything in the middle, all has to do with Jesus. That's what we got to pass on to the next generation. And look, as believers, this morning we have the opportunity to do some, some remembering, don't we? Communion. Hopefully you had a chance to grab one of these on your way in from one of the tables on the side or the back. If you didn't, you could sneak back there and grab that right now. We're just going to have a time this morning to reflect upon the words that I've shared, upon the words of the, of the Word of God, right? Where are you in the eye test? Where are you? Are you a person of integrity? Is there idolatry in your heart? Is your identity with Christ? Where are you? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this bread represents my body broken for you. Likewise, at the end of that meal, he took the cup. He blessed it as well, and he said, this cup is a new covenant it's a new bond between me and my people, my church. This blood is, 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 this drink is my blood spilled out for your sin. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, may you do it in remembrance of me, remembering the great sacrifice that I paid for you so that on your ID card this morning could be three simple words. Child of God, let us pray. God, we thank you for this gift of bread and juice. And God, we pray that it would be for us today the body and blood of Christ, God. We thank you for the great sacrifice that you paid on that cross, that old rugged cross, God. We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you for the simple, subtle reminder that this is of that great sacrifice. God, that today when we pull out our ID card, it might read husband, it might read wife, it might read father, it might read mother, it might read minister, it might read doctor, lawyer, or anything else, God. But what it should read above all else are three simple words, child of God, forgiven by you, loved by you. That's who we are. That's who we are. That's who the church is called to be in this year of 2021. So may we be it in every way as we reflect during this time this morning. 
And we pray it in Christ's precious name. Is 
no hiding. 